This video contains content that viewers may find disturbing. Viewer discretion is advised. Welcome back to 100 Horrible Ways People Can Die. I'm John. And I'm Alex. Today's episode is about being burned alive. Being burned alive is a very horrible way, one of the most excruciating and horrible ways a person can die. And there's many ways that it can happen. Yes. And we'll talk about a couple of those today. But for example, house fires. Or forest fires. Car fires. Industrial fires. Uh, residential fires. Lots of fires. Yeah. Just stay away from fires if you can. Yeah. Okay. That's a good point. Yeah. So... It's, it's a slow and excruciating process that could take minutes or mm -hmm. hours. Um, there's lots of different agonizing things that happen to you. For example, uh, proteins in your body break down and liquidate, and then steam comes up, and you get steam burns from fire. Oh, from okay. We don't yourself. usually get to the gruesome stuff till yeah, later. But let's get into some gruesome. Get into some gruesome stuff this yeah. episode? Okay, sure. What else happens to you? Well... A lot of things can happen to you. So we are specifically talking about being burned alive as opposed to, for example, being in a house that's on fire, inhaling smoke and passing away from the right. smoke. We're talking about So a specific burning. set of circumstances where your body is physically receiving radiant heat from the fire, yes. conductive heat from the fire if you're touching a hot object. Right. Like you mentioned, your proteins will denature, but that's more of a secondary trait. Usually the first thing that will kill people in those situations from what I've read is heart attacks because what happens oh. is the blood pressure changes as you said as your skin mm -hmm. boils steam comes out of your body it changes your blood pressure it puts you into a state of cardiac arrest horrible horrible horrible, horrible. so let's just get into our first historical event yes. the the uh triangle, triangle shirt, shirt waist factory factory fire right fire yeah okay so this is a tragic industrial disaster that occurred on march 25th 1911. yes it happened in new york city mm-hmm and it remains one of the most deadly industrial fires in history, yeah. even today. Even today. It's still history. It, that's right. And it claimed the lives of 146 workers, mm -hmm. most of whom were immigrant women. Right. At the time, New York City was a known area for sweatshops, for clothing manufacturing. So you had a whole area that's still called the Garment District, a lot of high rise for the, for the time. Buildings where you would have lots of young women, like you said, coming off of a boat from or probably from like Poland. Um, Italy, all over the place, Eastern Europe. Yeah. Yep. And they're all working as seamstresses in these factories. They're very tight. They don't really have air conditioning, right? It was overcrowded, it was overcrowded. Um, the factory Wooden materials, lots of yep. waste rags and lots of waste clothing product yep. products, which would be probably cotton. Yep. So this factory produced blouses, women's blouses. And, um, mm -hmm. these, With these operators were that, that this fire affected the most. They were on the eighth and ninth floor. Right. of this building so the fire started on march 25th 1911 mm -hmm. it broke out on the eighth floor of the factory and was caused by they believe it was caused by a cigarette or a match right so people would smoke even yeah. as they're working near a pile of rags which that's just an accident mm -hmm. waiting to happen yeah they didn't think anything of it like it was a normal practice right. for them they wouldn't have had fire extinguishers probably. and it was highly flammable yes. stuff they were working with and they might have had oils and other factory related items varnish or i don't know what they use for i'm not a seamstress i don't never sewed in my life so i don't know but probably some kind of oils that are flammable on that fabric so it's basically just kindling that's right and it says that workers on the eighth and tenth floors went ahead and ran down the stairwells mm -hmm. and uh and some went to the building's roof but others that were on the ninth floor they were trapped uh right. the doors were locked because the uh the owners were super strict they locked the exit doors they blocked them. They didn't want people stealing, so they, they didn't trust their employees, so they just locked them in there. Mm -hmm. And um, and the one door was completely locked. The other door opened inward, mm -hmm. so they were crowding on the door, and they couldn't get it. They couldn't pull it open because they right. were all pushing into each other. And, of course, the elevators didn't work because of the heat. Right. And um, you shouldn't – I mean, they didn't know at this time, but you shouldn't get in an elevator anyways if there's a fire. Right. And then so many of them jumped from the window to escape the flames and they just died on the pavement. They just hit the pavement and died. Right. And they had fire escapes if you could get to them. But yep. obviously in this type of a situation where you have a very crowded workspace mm -hmm. with a lot of smoke and a lot of acrid smoke from all the things that are burning, yep. 
you're probably going to be very disoriented and it's very hard to get to those. Oh no, they got on the fire escapes. They, they collapsed and they fell to their deaths. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. That's really bad. The, the fire escapes weren't like today up to today's codes where, you know, right. it would, it would hold people. It was just a fire Hopefully, escape. Yeah. They went out and it, right. it collapsed and they, they were either injured or died from that as well. Right. Um, so in this situation, even though we talk about a lot of people dying, a yeah. lot of them were probably not burned alive. That's right. Some people definitely were. That's right. People who couldn't get out and trapped, yeah. but they probably did pass from smoke inhalation or heat exhaustion or shock of something else first. Right. Falling into the, their death. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. So uh, it says that the fire department arrived very quickly and they were able to put out the fire within half an hour, but mm -hmm. their ladders weren't long enough to reach the ninth floor to help people down. So they had to deploy safety nets, right. which failed to catch people sometimes right so people know. would jump and if there's too many people in them or if mm -hmm. they ripped then they would just fall through and basically die that that's point. right so 146 workers died from burns smoke inhalation or falls so those those are horrible ways to die right there yeah. all, all of them are all of them and so the dangerous conditions of this factory led to an investigation and during the investigation um, more laws were put into place because there was nothing to say you couldn't lock these doors or block these doors right. or there was no laws in place to protect these workers. So uh, a lot of new regulations were created because of this incident. Right. In New York City, for example, having all those tall buildings has some of the strictest fire laws in the world. And part of the reason is because of the public outrage that happened because of this event. And actually, this event also led to the demise of the garment industry in New York City. Yeah, it, it became very unpopular. People were becoming aware of the horrors of sweatshops and all that stuff and without getting into too much detail those this uh, conditions don't exist this in the event US also anymore. led to the uh the labor movement leading to the growth of the international ladies garment yes. workers union which fought right. to better the conditions and fair wages for garment workers so, it was really a watershed moment in history which is yeah. why we picked it and all due to a fire basically. yeah all due to a fire it would have eventually happen somewhere else if it didn't happen here but some event like this would have happened because of the unsafe conditions now there's a lot of like um eyewitness uh mm -hmm. you know stories out there that you can find on the internet but we went we went ahead and and made one up so let's go ahead and imagine that we're somebody who survived this or that we're looking through the eyes of somebody who survived, survived this fire, fire. Yeah. yeah so let's let's get into that story okay the day began like any other at the triangle shirtwaist factory as a young immigrant woman, I was grateful for the opportunity to work and provide for my family, despite the grueling hours and strict supervision. As I stood at my workstation on the ninth floor, the hum of sewing machines and the chatter of my fellow workers filled the air. Suddenly someone screamed, fire! Panic surged through the factory as we all scrambled to find an escape. The flames grew rapidly, fueled by the piles of fabric and wooden workstations surrounding us. The smoke was thick and suffocating, making it difficult to see and breathe. I followed the desperate crowd toward the exit, only to find the door locked. Panic turned to terror as we pounded on the door, begging for someone to unlock it. The heat was unbearable and I could feel my eyes stinging from the smoke. I knew I had to find another way out. I spotted a narrow window and without a second thought, climbed onto the windowsill. As I lifted myself up, the flames licked at my heels searing my skin and causing me to cry out in pain. I could feel the intense heat on my feet, the fire rapidly breaking down the proteins in my skin cells and causing tissue damage. The terrified screams of my co-workers echoed behind me, amplifying my own fear and desperation. My feet throbbed with unbearable pain, and I could feel the heat causing the blood vessels to dilate and leak fluid, leading to blistering and swelling. I knew that if I stayed there any longer, I risked causing even more damage to the deeper layers of tissue, potentially exposing muscles, tendons, and bones. Despite the excruciating pain, I forced myself to focus on the window and the pavement below. I hesitated, the fear of the fall battling the agony of my burning feet. It was a terrifying drop, but I knew I had no other choice. Drawing on every ounce of strength and determination I had, I prepared to leap from the window driven by the urgent need to escape the relentless fire and the searing pain in my feet. As I prepared to jump, I noticed a fire ladder slowly ascending toward the window. Relief washed over me, but I knew I had to act quickly. 
The fire was closing in and the ladder was still several feet below me. I mustered all my courage, closed my eyes and leaped, hoping to grasp the ladder as I fell. My hands caught the cold metal of the ladder just in time and I clung to it, my heart pounding in my chest. I could feel the heat of the fire above me as I carefully descended, trying not to look down. Well, at least that woman survived that story. Yeah, harrowing fake story that we heard there. It was amazing. She yeah. she really made it. Real, real triumph of the human spirit. She pulled through for sure. And yeah. uh, her, the details, the attention to detail on that story was actually pretty good. Almost like it was a real person that was there. Yeah, it's almost like we wrote that ourselves, but we didn't. All right, well, so let's get into the, uh, the stats here. So... Okay. Let's see what do we got here. Approximately 80% of fire deaths and 70% of fire injuries occur in homes and cars. Right. So we talked about an industrial accident. Those are relatively less frequent. The reason we do hear more about those is because when they do happen, they tend to have a higher death or fatality or injury count or whatever. Right. Injury count. Number of people. That I was trying to look for. Right. There we go. Something like 16 to 17% of all fatalities in fires occur in cars or automobiles yeah so that is a very understated risk and i think we can kind of understand how that would happen you know somebody's let's say drunk or something and crashes into a tree in the middle of the night yep. the car catches fire they're either intoxicated or hurt from the accident can't get out yeah then they burn alive in there yep and that accounts for approximately 3800 civilian deaths well fire as a whole not just the civilian cars, fire deaths yeah yeah 3800 yeah. Total civilian fire deaths of which 17% yeah. possibly year to year fluctuates yep. in automobiles or Yeah, it's trucks, super hard cars, to, to find year over year ATVs, numbers. Probably not motorcycles too much, but maybe. Right, right. Okay, so we got uh, fire department responses. Mm -hmm. So one, on average, a fire department responded to a fire somewhere in the United States every 23 seconds in 2021. It's a lot, right? It's 20 Every lot. 23 seconds. You know, that's. Yes. A, a lot. A home fire was reported every 93 seconds. So that's every minute and a half or so. Yep. Yeah. And a home fire death. So obviously home fire leading to a death. Right. Was approximately every three hours and eight minutes in 2021. So quite. quite and a home fire injury occurs every 47 minutes. Yes. Approximately. I, I there are a lot more. Yeah. Approximately. I mean, it's it's depends on the year. It depends on right. other factors, too. There are a lot of injuries from fires that are not fatal, mm -hmm. but could cause complications that could lead to life altering injuries or could potentially become fatal down the road. So we specifically are talking about being burned to death, but just being burned in general, especially in the past, was a common way to die because it would lead to an infection. Oh, that's interesting. So, so fire safety has gone way up because yes. in 1980, the death mm -hmm. rate was about 28.6 million. And in 2020, it's down 10 point six. Right. So according to this research study, we found that took in census data from 1980 to 2021, the rate of fire deaths in the United States dropped by about 46%. No, no, no. The population oh, sorry, grew by 46%. I can't read. That's my problem. <laughs> but the but the number of deaths per fire, for fires has gone yes. way down. So even though the census population right. grew 46% yes. during that time period, period, the fatality rate actually dropped by about 50%. So right. that's about... a quarter of the fatality rate right. adjusted for population well you don't really need to adjust it's already adjusted in there so and in single family homes or, uh, or or multi-family homes are way more dangerous than like an apartment building for fires surprising i i think it's the safety regulations that are in apartment buildings because um i used to uh to work like mm -hmm. doing that type of work and there used to be fire protection coding between each apartment and things yeah like that, that could be part of it where in like a single family dwelling that might have been uh converted to a multifamily or just a duplex or something like that right it doesn't have the same codes so if one side catches they both catch or you know the house right. itself catches they don't have each room like fire protection you know right protected right, right. off you know so I believe when I looked into this, about 16 to 17% of Americans, maybe with 18%, you know, changes every year, live in apartment buildings, so multifamily apartment buildings, right. as opposed to a single or multifamily house. And they are safer than people in a, and, in a single family Right. Home. Something like 13% of all fatalities, if I remember correctly, were in apartments. So it's 
slightly safer right maybe 10 percent, 20 10 or safer. so yeah and i think a lot of it is also because you're more risky you're doing more risky things in a single family home yeah like maybe you have a garage a fireplace. attached to your house or fireplace yeah. or something like that and and you just make mistakes so just Bonfires, be careful you know, just, you know, yeah, yeah fires in your backyard fire pit Plus a lot of apartment buildings are made out of stone at least in or concrete lot, yeah. so that i don't, and, I don't know and percentage. Steel, right Right, so they're yeah. less flammable, possibly. Right, right. Whereas almost all single-family homes are probably made out of wood. Yeah. So here's some tips. So if you, if you uh, find yourself in a fire predicament, make sure to alert others. Yes. Um, don't use the elevators if there's a fire. And That's right. If, I'm actually not sure why people say that. I would assume it has to do with smoke inhalation. Well, I think that like if the fire is on a lower floor, right, uh -huh. and the and it gets to the elevator, it's gonna, heat rises, right? So it's gonna. I, that's burn. what I'm yeah, assuming yeah. too, and I'm assuming if. The, I'm assuming if the power goes out or some other issue happens, that you can get stuck in there. Yeah, and, and get cooked. Yeah, that'd be horrible. You, it's basically metal locks, so it's an yeah, oven. Yeah, But I've never actually seen a reason why people say that. So I don't know. I, I just wouldn't do it just episode. for safety. Yeah, when I we just eventually wouldn't. get to an episode about elevators, we should probably <laughs> talk about that. Right. And if you're trapped, seal the room. If you can't get out, seal the room. Put, like, wet towels down under the door, you know, at right. the door seams and things like that. If you have duct tape in there, you find something, just seal it off the best you can. What I've seen from Duct some tape in every, every room. news articles and <laughs> papers that I've read is that people who do create a fire break, even in a single family wooden home, yeah. by closing a door, closing, let's say something connecting to a different room, mm -hmm. sealing it, like you said, with yeah. Wet towels, towel or any t anything, really. are much more likely yeah. to survive long enough to be rescued yeah. in the case of a total structural failure. Right. And sealing it from uh, like the door frame over there that we have, mm -hmm. for example, with a wet towel, will prevent the smoke from getting into that's your room. That's right, and then you don't die the, the smoke. most likely way you'll actually that's die. most people die, smoke yeah. inhalation, yeah. Or carbon monoxide. Right. Yeah. So, and last but not least, make sure you call for help. You know, yes. call 911. Nine yeah. Or 911 in case you can't find the 11 button on your phone. Wow, that was, that was awful. I know. I know. All right, so... Um, Anything else we want to talk about before we get to our next story? No, I think we should get to our next story. I think we should too. Yeah, let's see. The next story is drumroll. Uh, let's see. I think it's the Pistigo Fire. Yes, the Pistigo Fire, which is it 1871? Is that correct? Yep, it was. It was 1871, and it's actually the deadliest wildfire, almost said wildflower, in U.S. history, and it's not very well known about. Right, I. It I had occurred. never heard of it before this episode. So, all right. So this fire is super interesting because it happened in 1871. Yes. In October. On October 8th specifically. Yep. And what happened was there's it's there's some weird stuff about this fire that we yes. that I'd like to talk about. Oh, okay. People thought that UFOs might have had something to do with this fire. Really? They saw fireballs coming out of the sky. Okay. And hitting the forest. Oh. And and chicago caught on fire at the same time yes so and it was actually like three states all had fires all around the same time right and people witnessed fireballs coming from the sky and objects that they couldn't recognize so hmm. this could have been ufos interesting oh not i don't not really i don't, I don't probably, think it was probably UFOs. not probably not but that's that's a conspiracy theory you can find online i sure. saw that I'm sure you can find any conspiracy theory online, but that's not <laughs> what the show is about. We're talking about facts here. I just thought it was fun. I thought it was fun too. I do think it is a very strange coincidence that this fire, which is the deadliest wildfire oh. in U.S. history, occurred on the same exact day as the Great Chicago Fire. That's right. For completely different reasons. And that fire overshadowed this fire, yes. even though this fire was larger. And two or three days later, there was another fire, for example, I think it was in Detroit, that burned Detroit for a significant part of it. A couple of other very large fires in that area in the Midwest. I guess yeah. it's considered the Met, I guess the Great Lakes, all within a couple of days span. But when you read about the history, it kind of makes sense. It was a very dry summer. It was a very hot. It was a summer. very dry. It was a drought. It was also drought. Yeah, it's a drought. Yeah, there's drought. It's a hot summer. Population density had grown quite. They didn't heavily. have any type of like forest control like they have now no. with controlled burns and things like that. However, they were doing some controlled burns to make make paths through the forest at that time too. Yes, I learned. Which they learned. think might have. I read a lot about because there was real wind, a lot of wind that day. A lot day. of wind that day. So they think maybe one of these like 
you know, they're burning out a part of the forest to try to make way for, I think maybe the railroad or a the, highway or something. The land management there was very different. A lot of people would clear cut the forest by burning it and then put yeah, crops they, in there. That's so right. That, that happens. That's well, also yeah. partially what caused some of the drought there because without right. proper forestry management and wetland management to control the moisture in the soil, everything would dry out. And yeah, they didn't have, you know, they didn't. No, we didn't really care back yeah, then. Yeah, right? yeah, we were a growing nation. Yeah, we were just like, yeah. whatever, just get it done with. Right. There was like firestorms that happened in this thing. Yeah. It, it spread it around. It just, right. it went everywhere. And they didn't have really the technology we have now. And you didn't have fire departments even back then, really. I mean, I think the, not most municipal fire departments fire, happened as a result yeah. of the Great Chicago Fire. But they definitely before. didn't have like aircrafts dropping buckets of water and stuff well, like they did now. It'd be kind of hard to have aircraft in, dropping I know, I buckets know. of water 100 years or whatever, 50 years before <laughs> aircraft really took off. Right. So, I mean, maybe, maybe it was UFOs. You All right. Know. So, again, I think we should get into let's imagine a story of someone who survived this. Let's do that. All right. The day started out like any other, with an eerie stillness in the air that I couldn't quite put my finger on. As the evening approached, I noticed a strange orange glow on the horizon. I couldn't quite make out what it was at first, but as the sun began to set, the glow intensified. That's when I saw them. Fireballs, or so they seemed, streaking across the sky. I stared at them in awe, completely unaware of the impending disaster. As the fireballs disappeared, the unthinkable happened. Flames sprang up all around me, seemingly out of nowhere. The heat was unbearable, and I could feel my skin prickling from the intensity. Smoke filled my lungs, making it difficult to breathe. The crackling of the fire grew louder, and I knew that I had to leave my home and seek refuge elsewhere. I ran out into the street, and what I saw was pure chaos. People were screaming and running, trying to save their belongings, their families, and themselves. I spotted a young couple struggling to carry their unconscious child through the flames. Without a second thought, I rushed to help them. We formed a human chain, passing the child through the searing heat and smoke, desperately trying to save him. In the process, I felt the heat of the flames licking my arms, causing immense pain. I gritted my teeth and kept moving driven by adrenaline and the desire to help those in need. The firestorm was relentless, and the strong winds only served to fan the flames. They roared like an angry beast, consuming everything in their path. It was as if the sky itself was on fire, with embers raining down like a deadly rainstorm. The air was thick with ash, making it difficult to see, and I stumbled through the darkness, feeling the scorching ground beneath my feet. We made our way to the river, hoping that the water would offer some protection from the inferno. I plunged into the cold water, the sudden temperature change shocking my system. We huddled together, shivering from the cold, but grateful to be shielded from the worst of the fire. As we watched the flames consume everything around us, we knew that we had narrowly escaped with our lives. The night seemed to stretch on forever, and the sounds of the fire continued to haunt us. The crackling, the screaming, and the cries for help were etched into my memory, a terrifying reminder of the harrowing experience we had survived. When dawn finally broke, we emerged from the river, covered in ash and soot, and surveyed the devastation that had been wrought upon our town. We had escaped with our lives. Well, that was an interesting story. Yeah. I don't know if I actually saw any historical accounts of people surviving the fire. But... I didn't see any, but... To That's be honest, why we made I didn't one up. Really look for them. I look more about the situations revolving around the fire, but there were a lot of stories about people trying to jump in rivers to try to get out of the fire. Yeah, actually, that's why that was in the story. Water was and, quite cold. Um, and ChatGPT did a great job on yeah. that. Thank you, ChatGPT. Of course, yeah. of course, I had to give it the some of the ideas. Oh, did you? Not really. All right, so um, <laughs> let's get into some of the statistics on, on wildfires this. about about wildfires, you know specific wildfires. Yeah, yeah. so. The National Interagency Fire Center says between 2000 and 2020, mm -hmm. an average of 18 wildfire woodland firefighters die each year in the United States. Due to wildfire-related yeah. injuries? Yeah, yeah. yeah. So according to that same research, yeah. the number of civilian casualties is more challenging to estimate. Well, that's kind obvious. of obvious. Yeah. Um, doesn't really give us a whole number, but... For example, the 2018 campfire in California caused 85 fatalities. Right, right. And I think part of the issue with some of these numbers and collecting data for it is wildfires are probably one of the 
most common situations where you will really see people burned alive yeah there'll be very little left to there's not there's nothing left yeah alive. it's just ash so yeah. well it's not just ash but well, we'll that's, talk about that that's more later. true but then, yeah so the likelihood of a disaster like this uh shigo fire occurring again mm -hmm. has been reduced significantly due to advancements in technology right because, i think so as well yeah because they just didn't have it we have a better understanding now of fire behavior there's like fire you know we know the chemistry of fire better right. and um we have better forest management services um well we have radar and planes so for example we can planes. see where those things are coming That's from right. part of the reason that the Pestigo fire was so dangerous was or so deadly was that people had no warning for the most part absolutely not yeah they had no warning at all and they had um, very little way to get out of there so at least today though in one of these situations there would be a lot of traffic a car can go much faster than you can by walking oh yeah yeah so, yeah yeah there wasn't the back in the day yeah right. so so then um also let's talk a little bit about the campaigns so smoky bear was like one of the most successful uh campaigns there were mm -hmm. about forest fires and it was so successful that there were times where they were like you know forests are there haven't been a for any forest fires but fire forests are dying what's going on right and it turned out that some plants or some trees actually have to have a fire right to sprout seeds right right fire is part of the regenerative cycle of forests yeah and specific areas like the redwood forest mm -hmm. some of the plants there the redwood specifically are designed to withstand fire they have right. really thick bark yeah and the seeds can only germinate after they've been exposed to fire right and it's a very efficient strategy if you think about it let's build up all this extra detritus all this extra yeah. dead material get a really hot forest fire going so it kills all the competition yeah so our seeds can take off and, and the start little seeds over. pop like a kernel of popcorn and yeah and they fly everywhere if and I'm then mistaken. they and, and they grow there's probably so. some good documentaries on this but yep so let's see so over the years smoky bear campaign ex uh, expanded and included mm -hmm. educational materials and public service announcements and partnerships to promote promote uh, different behavior in forests okay uh because only you can prevent forest fires yes I, only me smoky, um, nobody smoky else smoky bear used to say it's got a nice too. personal touch to yeah. it i think that's what makes itself so well that's right so let's get into some tips okay. so i have some tips here specifically on... about wildfires yeah yeah okay. so these are tips in addition to public awareness campaigns right so, uh, to risk to reduce the risks of forest fires so what has been done obviously okay. is the forest management fire right. breaks the technology we've we've developed mm -hmm. and then the early detection and monitoring like you were talking about right so if you do catch on fire in a forest fire yeah like if you're in the woods and you yeah. catch fire yeah so if you're in a forest and it catches on fire and it, you're at in, at risk of catching on fire get low and crawl because okay. you want to stay below the heat. Where are you crawling to? You know, just away. Away you from? See fire, away from the fire. Oh. If you're surrounded by fire. It's about to say, if you're surrounded by fire, where are you crawling away from? Means... You're just going to just drop and roll. Okay. I think. Because of what else can you do? Yeah, I think. Bury yourself. People Is that have done that. I think people do that. I think people have dug holes and like buried themselves and put something, you know, now, try to put something over. Them. I'm sure there's some good training material for people who are woodland firefighters. You can, you can definitely you can probably look find it up. But I, I know that I, I kind of remember seeing something somewhere. It might have been a fictional show, but okay. there were firemen and they were getting surrounded. So they just dug in there was and they a movie had that like came this, out recently about they this. had like this tent uh -huh. of uh, reflective material. Oh, aluminum reflective yeah, material. Yeah, and they just, they dug in and then they put this like tent thing over them to try to protect them from the fire. So I guess if you have time, dig a hole, I guess. I don't know. Probably the safest tip or the best safety tip, probably that's a better way of phrasing it, is to not be in the forest when it's on fire. Yeah, get away from the forest. If get you away see from smoke, the forest. there's probably fire. You know, a lot of people will, you know, they'll see water, like a standing pool of water, mm -hmm. um, and they'll get into the water. But there's been situations where I was looking and I saw where people have been boiled yes. in the water. People underestimate how hot a wildfire can get. It, it can be hot. over 2,000 degrees, yeah. which is enough to melt steel. Yeah. And yeah. not only that, the whole point of a forest fire is that it takes all the oxygen in the environment. Yes. So even if you go into a river, suffocate. you could still suffocate right and then eventually drown because you'll be unconscious you'll go in the water you'll drown that yeah, way it can happen even if the water doesn't overheat 
Right. It would have to so be a smaller mo- body so of water. So if it's moving water like a river like, like a and it's wide river, enough, it probably will be you, fine you because can, of the movement. And you can heat. and you can go down the river with. The That's water, true too. Yeah, and it, it could be an escape route. But I'm just saying, like a standing pool of water, like a pond or something. Right. If it's not very big, you you're know, probably you're not going to have gonna much luck it, there. So just uh, best to get away. Yeah, and then on top of that, not just the heat, the smoke itself is also a killer. You know, yep. forest fires throw a lot of smoke, and depending on what they're burning, I mean, if it's more natural, it probably isn't as bad for you. But once it hits into a residential area, there's going to be a lot of plastic fumes and other toxins in the air. And from it that. can catch some of the residential. Oh, residential property fires on fire. won't, yeah. won't stand a chance. Right. Yeah. You just stand out there with your garden hose. You know what? Just get out. People do do that. Just they evacuate. do wet all their homes before yeah. forest fire hits, and some people, I don't, I don't know if there's any research on it, but anecdotally have said it saved their homes. And I think the way that would work is if there's a ember that lands on their roof, instead right. of catching the roof on right. fire, it'll smolder out. Yeah, if you turn your fire, your sprinklers on your roof or yeah. whatever and get out of there, just get out of there is what I'm saying. The campfire has a lot of, I don't know if you want to say publicity, but a lot of play in the news. There's a lot of stories about it. And some of those stories are pretty sad and terrifying. People basically being told you have 10 minutes to get out of your house before the whole area will be yeah. engulfed in flames. Yeah, and you got to go. People underestimate how fast forest fires can move. I think it's something like 30 to 40 miles per hour at there's times. A, if there's high wind the winds. and there's no moisture in the air already because, you know, it's a drought or right. something, you just got to get away. That's all. Yeah, and usually when there is a forest fire, there are high winds because that helps fuel it. It's blowing fresh oxygen into the fire. Otherwise, they'll probably burn out more quickly. Right. And we talk about forest fires, but a lot of people also sustain injuries and deaths from just brush fires too because sometimes – brush can burn in the same way that a wildfire does and it's so, fast and it's just as fast it might even be faster because a lot of times it's on inclines and hills and fire can burn uphill very quickly mm-hmm. much quicker than downhill mm-hmm. the same way like if you light a candle obviously the Burns heat goes up. up so if you're on an incline like this the fire will go up right it's heat rises right that's how a lot of forest fires go up the mountains so yeah just because it's on that side of the mountain doesn't mean it's not going to come for you right yeah all right well i think that's all we have time for today is that so i think think so you got Uh any questions you want to ask the audience i do we got like three people who are waiting three people wow maybe maybe what's your what questions you want to ask for this show anything well i think we should ask them what they want to see in future episodes that'd be great if you want to leave us a message telling us what you'd like to see in the future that'd be amazing i mean to be honest you probably won't read it but you can still leave it no we'll i'll read it you'll read it i won't or will will read it we'll read it i can't respond too he'll he'll be like oh yeah Thanks for your tip on the next episode. Oh, we'll okay. we'll put that in as number fifty seven. Okay. What episode are we on right now? Four, five, five. I can't. So count. I don't 50 have that many episodes fingers. away. No, I'm just kidding. I don't know what we'll do. All right, yeah, guys. I don't well, know what we'll do either. Stay safe out there. Stay safe out there because you stole my line. Yep, I sure did. And remember, stay safe. Out there. <laughs> and don't forget, stay safe out there. And don't forget. All right.